The McDonald F3H Demon. Nice. Was a subsonic, swept wing, carrier based jet fighter aircraft that was designed by McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, introduced to the U.S. Navy in 1956. At a length of 59 feet, a wingspan of 35 feet 4 inches, a height of 14 feet 7 inches, a gross weight of 33,900 pounds, and they were powered by a single Allison J71A2E afterburning turbojet engine, capable of delivering 9,700 pounds of force dry, but 14,750 pounds of force with an afterburner. Their maximum speed at sea level was 716 miles per hour, but if they were higher, 30,000 feet, that would drop to 647 miles per hour, but still a decent clip for a subsonic jet. They had a range of 1,370 nautical miles, could fly for about three hours, had a service ceiling of 35,050 feet, and a rate of climb of 12,795 feet per minute. They were armed with four 20mm Colt Mark 12 cannons. They could also be equipped with four AIM-7 Sparrow or AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles, as well as up to 6,000 pounds of bombs. Now, the demons did not serve for very long, but not because they were inherently bad or anything. They just wound up being more of a stepping stone. A lot of lessons were learned from development on the demon, and its design would evolve to eventually become the legendary F-4 Phantom II. As such, one could look at the Demon and refer to it as the mother of the Phantom. Since without this aircraft, we may never have got the F-4s. In the late 1940s, the existence of the Soviet Union's MiG-15 fighter program was actually unknown to U.S. intelligence. But the U.S. Navy still anticipated that there would likely be high-performance Soviet jet fighters in the future, and would issue requirements for a swept-wing naval fighter on May 21, 1948. McDonnell was one of six aircraft companies to produce a response to this, and development work started in 1949. With the swept wing being a requirement, roll control was achieved via ailerons augmented by a compact spoiler, and both horizontal and vertical tail surfaces were also swept back. This aircraft was actually their first swept wing design, and was among the first American aircraft that was designed to be primarily armed with missiles rather than cannons. And in order to fill every one of the Navy's requirements, they did agree to power the aircraft with the Westinghouse J-40 engine, which was still under development at the time. And this would prove to be a, a, a problem. The J-40 was a disaster in every sense of the word. While the engine promised very good capabilities, it really never achieved that with any degree of reliability, which was kind of the issue. They just never worked. But Navy officials were really behind it early on, because it promised a thrust of over 11,000 pounds of force, which was three times the engines that were used on the McDonnell F-2H Banshee. And in the early days, it wasn't known what a fiasco the J-40 would become. McDonnell went ahead and produced two XF-3H-1 prototypes, though it was considered a fallback measure to the more unconventional Douglas F-4D Skyray, which is its own story. And they envisioned the aircraft as day fighters, Development probably would have taken much more of a backseat if not for the sudden appearance of the MiG-15s during the Korean War. When that happened, the U.S. military realized they were behind when it came to fighter design. The Navy contacted McDonnell and made it clear that the Demon was a top priority. The MiGs outclassed both the Panther and the Banshee. And while the Air Force managed to scramble and get the F-86 Sabre into service, that was, well, the Air Force. The Navy didn't have anything. They started pushing McDonnell to heavily redesign the airplane, reorienting them from short-range interceptors to medium-range all-weather fighters, which is great and all, but these adaptations would add 7,000 pounds of weight to the Demons, which impacted their performance in the end. But the Navy really was worried about this, and in March of 1951, they hastily ordered 150 F-3H-1Ns into production. They ordered it without even reviewing the mock-up. 
Heck, the prototype wouldn't even first fly until August 7th. They were really panicking about the MiG situation. Fortunately, though, the prototype actually was alright. Test pilot Robert Edholm found it really easy to fly and fairly maneuverable with responsive controls, but he also noticed she was underpowered, which severely impacted high-altitude performance. The first test flights of the operational design didn't actually happen until January of 1953. And by that point, the Korean War was coming to an end. One of the biggest problems they ran into during development was the stupid J-40 engine. As I mentioned earlier, the things were, frankly, just complete pieces of junk. On the rare occasion they functioned, they only produced half of the expected power, and they suffered from a restricted flight envelope and frequent compressor stalls. James Smith McDonnell himself, the president of the company, personally wrote to Washington, warning them that the engine was garbage. He didn't say it that way. He said that it would be a disappointingly underpowered combination, which is fun business code for garbage. He requested to substitute a different engine, but the US Navy at the time persisted with the J-40 in the hopes that it would bear fruit. But Westinghouse eventually showed that they couldn't progress smoothly on the project, and the whole thing turned into a complete mess as time went on. 35 of the F-3H1Ns were flown with J-40s installed. Eight of them were involved in major accidents. The first production demons were actually grounded after the loss of six aircraft and four pilots. It was a disaster, and eventually, McDonnell got their way. All the remaining demons on order that were supposed to use J-40s were either cancelled or redesigned to use other engines. But the other problem was, the original demons that had been constructed couldn't be easily remodeled to fit new engines. They needed their wings and fuselage completely redesigned and enlarged. The associated costs and delays were bad enough that the Navy considered cancelling development of the demon as a whole. But fortunately for McDonnell, that did not happen. The best alternative was the Allison J-71, but even they had their issues when they were used to power an aircraft of the demon's size. They would suffer from flameouts and compressor stalls. Also, the demon's injection seat was... not really reliable. McDonnell had made them in-house, and theirs had problems, so they had to replace them with Martin Baker ejection seats, which were becoming the standard U.S. Navy seat of choice due to higher performance at low altitude, also the fact that they generally worked. Despite all these problems, the demons would serve briefly. The Navy would place an order for 239 F-3H-2s. The first batch was deployed in March of 1956, and a total of 519 demons were constructed before production was terminated. Pilots, if they didn't call it the demon, would call them the chair, because one of McDonald's biggest pushes with the demon was to enhance pilot visibility. The nose had been tilted downwards by 10 degrees late in development, and the windscreen was changed multiple times to provide the best view possible, and pilots actually loved the plane for this trait. Demon pilots were also referred to as demon drivers, while the ground crews were called demon doctors. The pilots also really liked the planes for their flying characteristics, as well as high level of stability when being flown at high altitude. They were also inherently easy to land, so in many ways they were a very solid design, but they always had one problem that held them back. When they were annoyed with them, the pilots also called them lead sleds, because their engines were just never that powerful. As I mentioned when I talked about their development, a lot of weight had to be added to get them to where the Navy wanted them, but as a result, they always felt underpowered. Easy to fly and land? Yeah, they're great for that. But in terms of acceleration, they left a lot to be desired. A reconnaissance version was also proposed, but never built. And despite their shortcomings, they were flown as the U.S. Navy's frontline fighter until 1962. It was during the late 50s that McDonnell had started pushing for a Super Demon, as they called it. A solid improvement on the overall Demon design. There's a misconception that they jumped straight to the voodoo after the demon, and then to the phantom. But that's not true. For one thing, the voodoo was an Air Force plane, and it was derived from the earlier XF-88 voodoo, which, to be fair, did influence the demon in some ways, 
but the demon was an entirely separate thing in most regards, and it directly led to the Phantom. Though, it is worth mentioning that all the planes bear many similarities. The demon would eventually give rise to the Phantom, which is arguably one of the best jet fighters ever, especially in their day. But unfortunately, this meant that the mother of the Phantom, the demon, hardly had any time to really shine. They claimed no aerial victories during their service life, as they really just never had a chance to get any. And in September of 1964, the final demon-equipped squadron, VF-161 Chargers, traded in their demons for the new F-4 Phantom IIs. Most would be scrapped after that, though three did manage to survive, fortunately. 137078 is at the National Museum of Naval Aviation at Naval Air Station, Pensacola, Florida, 133566 is at the USS Intrepid Museum in New York City, and 145221 is at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona. While the demon doesn't get much love in the modern day, and is often overlooked, personally I think they deserve a lot more appreciation. Yeah, they were underpowered, but let's be real, the whole fiasco with the J-40 was not their fault at all and McDonald clearly knew they were onto something with the overall layout of the Demon, which is why they evolved it into the most produced American supersonic military aircraft in history. Maybe there isn't a heck of a lot you can say about the actual Demon itself, but if her kid's anything to go by, she's a great mom. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267 Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Lord R444, A Person 723, Royal Hudson 2060, Isaac for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheel Jack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitsune 131 232, Mark Holding, Dr. Racer 78, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Liam Wright, Hayden DeGro, Metal for Life Guy, Battle 604, Hannah Bird, Railroad Preserver 2000, No, Eric Hutton, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.